All right, one, two, one, two, I think it works. Okay, so we're going to start. Zituni should join us in, in a few minutes, but um, as uh, Anna has to go soon, I think we will just like uh, get the, the, the star session started. So thank you so much for, for joining us today for this 90 minute session. Um, where we'll explore the potential of protein diversification to tackle uh, the climate crisis and build resilient, climate-compatible, healthy, and just food systems. So my name is Rafael Patelva, and I work with the food awareness organization uh, ProVeg International. Uh, ProVeg Pro aims at shifting our current food systems um, towards more plant-rich and healthy diets. Um, we work with policymakers, health professionals, corporations and startups, and we opened, for example, the first European plant-based uh, startup incubator in Berlin four years ago. Um, so this session is co-organized in partnership with uh, the Good Food Institute, GFI, Compassion in World Farming, and Brighter Green. Uh, we will have speakers in the next uh, 80 minutes um, from the UN, from national delegations, and civil society. Um, each speaker committed to present between six to eight minutes maximum, and we will have at least 20 minutes uh, for question and answers uh, at the end of this session. Uh, so before we start uh, with uh, this time Anna, uh, let me say a few words on why diversifying protein intakes globally is such an important topic. Um, first of all, we have to acknowledge uh, that our current food system um, is broken. We have like uh, over 800 million people worldwide facing hunger, uh, while more than 40% of um, adults globally are overweight. So we're not feeding everyone and we're making uh, other people sick. On food itself, we know that we produce a lot of food, but we uh, literally waste uh, more than a third of the food we produce. So like, hence also the absurdity of, of the system at the moment. Um, we know how important um, food systems are when tackling climate change, uh, as emissions from the food sector uh, represent one-third of total greenhouse gas emission, but animal agriculture um, alone is responsible for almost 20% uh, of total greenhouse gas emissions, according to a recent article published in, in Nature Foods. Um, roughly 83% of the world's farmland is used um, for livestock, even though these products only produce, provide 37 approximately percent of protein and 18 percent of calories of our diet. <clears throat> Diets. So with the global uh, population expected to reach 10 billion by 2050, uh, demand for meat is expected to almost double. Um, it is therefore time to radically transform uh, our food system and think both of other ways of producing animal source proteins while also encouraging the production and consumption of less resource-intensive plant-based proteins. Um, research showed that by 2050, protein diversification, including here investing in plant-based and cultivated meat, uh, could reduce global emission by 10 to 14 gigatons CO2 per year and free up an area uh, the size um, of land the size of the Amazon forest. So a lot, of course, of, of co-benefits. So we see how important it is to tackle food systems when we speak about climate change. Um, and uh, we really hope that eventually um, the, the Egyptian COP27 pre presidency will also include uh, a food day in Sharm el-Sheikh because we definitely need uh, to step up actions around food systems and also catalyze everything that has happened since um, the food system uh, summit. Um, so this is also, I think, specifically like in the context of the methane and deforestation uh, commitments, a very important part. Um, so we would actually start with Anna, if that's okay with you, Zituni, because Anna has to go uh, very uh, soon. So like uh, Anna Salminen, uh, you are a senior specialist at the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry in, in Finland. Uh, you're also coordinating the work at the EU level on international climate negotiations on Coronivia, so KJWA, a topic that, that we all know well. And uh, previously, you have been working at the National Climate Programme for Food Consumption, and on the other hand, with the Climate Programme for Land Use Sector, um, covering also CO2 emissions uh, of agri from agriculture. So we would let you maybe give us an input from uh, six, eight minutes on what is happening in, in this case in Finland, and thank you very much for jumping in. Thank you so much for inviting me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, and I think my point of view is uh, to speak about that, how, how we can, as a governmental organization, support this change, and what kind of maybe uh, challenges we meet and and uh, how we try to tackle those and uh, first few words about our targets and then how are, we are going we are working on um, more plant-based diet and and then some pre reflections of uh, our experiences but as you mentioned uh, we we are uh, at the moment uh, still uh, about to be publishing our 
uh, climate program for um, food consumption. I was probably uh, telling about this in Glasgow, uh, that it's just about to be happen, and it still just about happened. So it's one point of view that it's not easy, easy to make these kind of decisions, not in a uh, European country either. And um, yes, so but we anyway we have really committed it uh, to our target to be climate neutral by 2035. And a uh, big issue are the um, uh, emissions of the agricultural sector, uh, among others, but in, in especially in the land use sector, that is the case. And, um, and we see that uh, the plant-based diet is one question, and this consumption towards that is supporting definitely this target, to achieve the target. And we also have a national target to reduce the uh, emissions of the agricultural totally. Uh, by uh, 2035 uh, with 29% and that is a lot so that means that we need all the all the uh, help to re uh, achieve that and and as we see that uh, our target for uh, how how does the plate look like 2035 we definitely see that the alternative proteins will be part of it uh, it means that we are eating more plant based and and more fish in Finland, you have the ability to use uh, uh, like sustainably fish, so so that is one part of it. We also have the tradition to eat fish, so it would be <laughs> going a bit like back to our tradition. And and then the big issue is uh, to eat, eat less meat and dairy products. We are really like uh, producing a lot of dairy products and in exporting them as well. Uh, as we did 100 years ago too, so it's not a, like a, uh, a little thing to try to change this either. And it is, has a re regional differences too. It, it's regionally really important still in Finland. And then, then some other uh, targets uh, are like uh, less food waste and loss and less, more seasonal food and then added value of the side streams. Um, but we see that this change is also supporting not only like um, uh, eating more plant-based plant um, food, it's um, also supporting uh, not only the climate target, but it's also supporting uh, food security, nutrition definitely, uh, and, and also self-sufficiency. So it's um, not everybody might see it that way, but, um, but uh, we have uh, good arguments <laughs> that it, it, that is the case. But how, what we do it practically in Finland, so um, um, it's important to support research. We don't know, we have, don't have that much in, uh, information on um, alternative proteins in Finland. Um, and we, are having, we have been financing uh, through our like, national um, climate program now a uh, research project on alternative proteins and, uh, and um, other. Um, alternative methods to um, produce food without uh, using land. And uh, there, I think the important is that uh, we have the researchers, the scientists uh, cooperating with the companies, and that is the case in those projects. So it's really something that, and those companies might be dairy companies or meat companies, and they are interested in uh, doing the new business too. So that is that is interesting project. The other thing is that uh, we definitely have to support the plant production. We've been supporting the dairy production a lot and meat production. Well, we are one of the most northern countries producing food anyway, so, so um, there is a reason why we still have, uh, why we rely on the uh, dairy production, but still um, we have to develop also um, um, like... Um, plants we we can we we have to be sure that we have peas for example we can grow in finland in finnish conditions so we have plenty of things to do and also the whole value chain has to be built and that is a big question and we also finance that kind of projects where companies and producers are uh, for example um, producing oil hemp for protein production and then 
uh, important thing for us is public food services. That is the place uh, where we meet uh, people from different ages. In Finland, the food uh, at the schools and, and kindergartens is free until you turn 18. So that is a big thing. It doesn't cost anything and it's a, uh, basically you get the warm meal daily. So, um, and uh, public food services are committed and obliged to follow the nutritional recommendations. So um, that is the way to work on this. And also because they are really like combined with the community and like cities, they also, the cities have their climate targets and that is the way to, um, to uh, implement those targets. So um, we are uh, encouraging and supporting public food services, how they can uh, be more sustainable. And then, um, at the end, I would like to say uh, what is the most important thing or has been during this process when we preparing this program for climate, uh, uh, like climate uh, friendly food program. It is to listen to the citizens. It is my plate and your plate where the this <laughs> change is going to happen. It's not enough that the change is happening also. Or, or, or only those ones really interested or having the ability to choose would be doing the change. The, we have to, um, uh, it has to be attractive to most of us. It has to be attractive and it has to be achievable. And uh, those things I was just mentioning are supporting that, but also it's important to discuss with the citizens. And that is something we've been having um, uh, dialogues in different parts of country to be able to understand better uh, how does it look like. And one thing we noticed is that uh, there are many ways to become more sustainable. Uh, so, um, and regional differences, and, and it's not about changing everything. You can find in your own traditions plenty of, plenty of um, uh, like recipes or, or traditional meals or, or uh, own things which actually are uh, sustainable and, and going towards more plant-based diet. So, and, and the last thing I want to mention is <laughs> that, um, that uh, um, if the meat is kind of taboo, they're eating me less meat or something we can't really, or some politicians might be not able to say it out loud, it's not easy for all of my colleagues either at the ministry because we understand so well that the farmers are not doing well in many parts of the country. But it's still something that we notice with the discussions with the citizens that um, people in different ages and different parts of Finland uh, are uh, thinking that it has, it's, it's doable and it might be like uh, they have different, um, different um, motivations why they change their diets, but they are able to do it if they are motivated and, and if it's attractive for some reason. So that's, that's what I want to encourage, to listen to the citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, and thank you for, for this presentation. Um, very impressive and interesting also to see like, uh, you know, uh, something happening precisely in, in a country like Finland. So like very, very encouraging and interesting. Uh, so thank you so much for, for taking the time to, to be with us uh, today. Uh, Zituni, if you would like to, to join us, I'm sorry, we just swept. <laughs> uh, we wanted to, to talk like, yeah, exactly. We'll, as uh, Anna will have like uh, another event. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Zituni Udada, who is the Deputy Director um, in the Climate and Environment Division at the uh, UNFAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, before joining FAO, he was a uh, head of uh, technology unit at UNEP, and he also worked Zituni for the British government for a very long time. Um, so Zituni, um, maybe we, you could give us here, like we could get one step back and get like the big picture, maybe from like the FAO's perspective. How do we build resilience uh, in food systems, and how do you see the role here precisely uh, of protein diversification um, in this? I'll let you for, for six to eight minutes, okay. All right, so thank you very much. Very pleased to add to the um, gender balance with you here. <coughs> and good afternoon, everyone. Um, yeah, just to say um, a couple of words to, to set the scene and also to, to highlight the importance of uh, the discussion today. 
uh, I was interested to, to hear about what you said about the dialogue with, with, with consumers um, that, that, that's so critical that we reach out to people, obviously, because at the end of the day, is is us, the people who, who need to make a difference and, and we need to act. And I'd like to to strengthen that by, by talking in families as well and with friends. You know, it's not just having dialogues with the public and not to forget it's us. We're talking about, about people. For the current situation where we are with the, the agri-food systems in, in general is that, you know, we really lost our connection with food, unfortunately. I don't think we respect food enough. Uh, I don't think we value the food enough. Uh, you know, talking about, you know, a diversification, um, you know, for uh, potential uh, new proteins, etc. But unfortunately, we throw a lot of food away. So we throw a lot of proteins away, actually. Um, you know, the third of the food that we produce for our consumption, we throw it away. And with that goes all the energy, the nutrients, the water, everything that went into producing that, and the money, because we buy food and then we, we throw it away. So my, my point is that, you know, we need to rethink, given the, the new world we're in and, and the urgency of changing our mindset, changing our attitudes on how we view things, uh, particularly when we see, you know, the world ahead of us also in terms of increasing population and how are we going to move around, what are we going to eat, you know, how are we going to consume um, new sources of energy as well. We have to change our mindset because we do waste a lot of the natural resources. Now, just talking about food, water, energy, you name it. And we really need to rethink about that and then liaise with people and, and our families and, and friends to, to raise their awareness about this. So that means that we, the, the transformation of agri-food systems is, is so urgent. Because the food, um, agriculture in general, agri-food systems as, as we call them, they're responsible for around the third of greenhouse gas emissions. And when I mentioned food loss and waste, that's responsible for about 7 or 8% of greenhouse gas emissions. Again, we use around 70% of, of the water available to us just to produce food. Etc. There's so so much pressure on the environment based on, you know, our way of living basically that we need to to rethink because it's not sustainable. So what we want to to do is transform the agri-food system so they are more sustainable, efficient, inclusive, because there is enough food to reach everyone, and yet we have around 811 million people who go hungry every day. It really doesn't make any sense. And then we also have around 2 billion people who are obese or overweight. So there is a really dysfunctionality in terms of how we, because we are responsible of, you know, the, the demand is very important for, for food. So the transformation is, is critical, is urgent, because we are talking here in the context at least of, of climate change, where we cannot fix really the climate crisis unless we fix you know, the agri-food systems to make them, as I said, more, more sustainable and, and more inclusive. And the resilience is, is also critical because all these crises have shown that agri-food systems are not resilient at all. They're easily disrupted by, by these shocks. And that's what we have to rethink about, you know, all these food chains that we have. So resilience is critical and also diversification in terms of how we produce food. And coming back to, 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 to the theme of, of proteins, diversification is also important because you know, we're talking about people around the world, not only in certain societies or others. So a healthy diet is really important to, for, for the growth, for, for the health of, of children, so they can grow up uh, properly. And fortunately, um, around 3 billion people can't even afford the cheapest mm. healthy diet. So you can see there's so many um, contrast in, in how actually we're um, you know, trying to, to feed people around the world in a way that is nutritious but also kind to, to the environment. 
And here I want to bring the, the point about uh, changing in mindset and behavior, but also harnessing the power of, of innovation to, to help us actually address these, these global challenges. Innovation in how we grow food, how we distribute it, how we store it, um, and then how um, we make it available to, to people um, around the world. Um, so ma malnutrition uh, rates, unfortunately, they are on the increase as well. Um, you know, as I said, healthy diets are not um, affordable by, by everyone. And if you just consider um, most of the, the food that we consume, which is mainly from maize, wheat, rice, and, and beans, these are, are, are food that are, you know, filling, but they are not particularly rich in, in nutrients and vitamins and, and minerals and proteins. So we have to diversify, obviously, our food. I mean, the point I'm making here is around the world, we tend to focus only on, you know, a few uh, foods, and yet there is a diversity around us, not just in terms of... Um, um, food, food from land, but from oceans as well. In, in fish, in various communities, we tend to focus on a limited number of fish, and yet there is a diversity. So we need to rethink of how we diversify and how we make sure that food reaches everyone and focusing on nutrition. So we don't produce food just for the sake of food, but food that is nutritious for, for generations to, to come. So this is the, the point I want to, to emphasize, is, is the urgency of transformation and diversification, and for us as people to take responsibility, really, of how we see food, how we, we value food. Because if we value something, we don't throw it away. You know, we don't throw our mobile phones away. We pay a lot of money for them. We pay for food every day. So we really need to, to rethink that. So I'll, I'll stop it here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lituni. Um, yeah, and I think it's especially also important topic, the affordability of healthy diets, because we talk about healthy diets, etc. And of course, uh, there is this question of affordability, who can really like, you know, uh, who can really uh, actually afford that, that I think is also like a very important uh, topic. So thank you so much for, for this. Um, we will uh, now, uh, our next speaker is uh, Sarah uh, Lahey, uh, is, who is Director of Sustainable Food System Innovation and Partnerships at One Acre Funds. Uh, she is responsible for identifying new uh, opportunities to contribute to the development um, of local food system that delivers benefits to both human and environmental health, as well as farmer uh, livelihoods. Um, Sarah has been with One Acre Fund for seven years, launching innovations and establishing scalable, scalable partnerships both on the ground in Rwanda and with a wide range uh, of partners uh, in Europe. So Sarah, let you for six to eight minutes and I have like the little presentation that I will so show. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Raphael. Um, Good afternoon. I am very happy to be here with you today as a representative of One Acre Fund, a nonprofit social enterprise that provides sustainable agricultural services to over three million smallholder farmers across nine countries of sub-Saharan Africa um, to help them increase their food production and build climate-compatible, resilient food systems. Today I'm going to tell you a little bit about our efforts to diversify and improve the supply of protein through a smallholder-centric model in Rwanda, an innovation we believe can deliver important benefits for people, planet, and prosperity. Uh, slide two, please. So I want to begin by introducing you to our typical client and the very reason that One Acre Fund exists. Um, she is typically a female head of household with a family of six, living in a hyper-remote rural area without access to the agricultural or financial services that she needs. She's working off of one acre of land to feed her family, farming predominantly staple crops on highly degraded soil. And under these conditions, she's not producing enough to feed her family, resulting in an annual hunger season of meal skipping and substitution. As a food security and development organization, we target smallholder farmers because they make up the largest proportion of the global extreme poor and the hungry. And in Africa, they steward the vast majority of the continent's agricultural land and are the primary producers of food. 
So it's clear um, they are key to achieving the SDGs, and how they farm and what they farm are really essential factors in building resilient, climate-compatible food systems able to meet growing food needs within ecological boundaries. Slide three, please. So for this population, protein energy malnutrition and micronutrient deficiency rates are extremely high, as my colleague Zetuni already mentioned. Um, the consequences are dire, resulting in very high rates of stunting and child mortality. Animal source foods are effective at targeting some nutrient deficiencies for these populations and have historically been the focal point of international nutrition programs. However, these foods also carry some major challenges. They're very expensive and thus unaffordable for most smallholder families. They also carry risk of foodborne illness, which is a driving factor behind malnutrition. And they're intensive to produce in terms of land use and water, which is particularly challenging for smallholders who are working with very small plots of land. So this reality has motivated us to think more creatively about opportunities and innovations to increase the supply and the consumption of protein in a way that delivers benefits for people, planet, and prosperity. This fits under a broader umbrella question that motivates all of our program design work. How can smallholder farmers meet their families' financial and nutritional needs while protecting or even improving environmental outcomes? Uh, next slide. So, to say nothing of the upsides or downsides of integrating livestock into smallholder farming systems, I want to focus specifically on the multitude of potential benefits from increasing production, local processing, and consumption of plant-based proteins. On the people side, or from a nutrition angle, plant-based proteins are naturally rich in many important micronutrients, and they can be processed to increase protein and micronutrient bioavailability. Plant-based meat alternatives can also be made to be shelf-stable, extending the shelf life of food to reduce food waste, as also mentioned by Zatuni, and reducing the risk of foodborne illness, again linked to malnutrition. Um, and they can be made to be cheaper than meat, which is an important factor for serving families um, for whom affordability is a key issue. And then lastly, the processing can also reduce cooking time, which is also closely tied to food security for rural households. From a planetary perspective, many plant-based proteins or plant-based protein products, like meat alternatives, are made from legumes that deliver really important soil health benefits through nitrogen fixation, which can also reduce the need for the use of synthetic fertilizer to improve soil fertility, which is increasingly difficult for smallholder families to access with rising fertilizer prices this year in particular. Um, and they're also extremely efficient in terms of uh, protein production um, relative to land use. And then lastly, from a livelihoods perspective, diversifying smallholder production away from lower value staples like maize that um, deplete the soil of its nutrients and into more climate resilient and higher value crops can deliver important income benefits for smallholders. And by establishing local processing, we can support local economic development as well. In some of the regions where we work, there's already substantial cultivation of local beans. But the challenge, or rather the opportunity, is to add value to these value chains. And it's with this in mind that One Acre Fund is now embarking on a new initiative to develop a complete value chain for plant-based meat production in Rwanda. Um, next slide, please. So what's unique about plant-based meat alternatives, as opposed to plant-based proteins in their original form, like um, local beans, is that they leverage the strong desire by the majority of people to eat animal meat to increase interest in and demand for plant-based proteins. This offers an opportunity to convert nutritious and climate sustainable crops for which there's low local demand, like soybean in the context of Rwanda, um, into foods that are highly sought after, such as meat, while also delivering important food systems benefits. One Acre Fund is uniquely positioned to do this because of our 15 years of experience working with smallholder farmers to increase adoption of sustainable agricultural practices. In Rwanda alone, we currently provide services to over 600,000 farmers at every step of the value chain. So we will now work with this large farming population to establish a complete value chain for local production of plant-based meat. We'll do this through three primary interventions. On the production side, we're going to contract farmers to produce a wide <coughs> range of sustainable, nutritious crops, such as millets like sorghum and other um, legumes. 
will offer them a competitive price that boosts household income, and will provide all of the necessary inputs and training to guarantee big yields and quality production. We'll then aggregate produce directly from these contracted farmers to a central processing facility where we'll process and fortify the product into a shelf-stable, locally suitable, nutritious, delicious, and affordable alternative meat product. And then we'll retail that product back into the rural communities where our clients live. Um, last slide, please. As a nonprofit, um, our most important emphasis here is impact for smallholder farmers specifically. So we want to ensure that this project respects food sovereignty and results in measurable benefits for nutrition, environment, and livelihoods. So we started with a, a series of consumer research efforts, so holding focus groups with rural consumers to understand the barriers to increasing protein consumption, their aspirations for their diets, and whether they would be interested in eating a plant-based meat product if it was available. The results were incredibly encouraging, demonstrating strong interest in having access to more affordable options than meat, and a lot of openness to plant-based meat alternatives. Importantly, this involved taste testing, where we gave uh, consumers the opportunity to taste a product and see if they really did think it would, could play a role in their diets. Um, so we're using this research now to inform our product design. We're also modeling the impact that local production of plant-based meat alternatives would have on the three metrics I mentioned, nutrition, environment, and livelihoods, and are substantiating our theory of change for each of these three areas with data, showing how we can drive impact across all metrics through this value chain. We're partnering with a university in the Netherlands on product design, optimizing the product to be as nutritious as possible while also still delicious and affordable, and ensuring it will be made entirely from locally and sustainably produced ingredients. And then lastly, we're optimizing the business model to deliver as much value back to the farmer as possible. We're in the very early stages of this work, still in the R&D phase, and working on securing funding for full establishment. Um, if this is something anyone's interested in learning more about, I would love to connect after the event. And with that, thank you. Thank you so much, and it's really fascinating to see, like, also, uh, I think, a very concrete project like that in, in Wanda. So thank you for that, and I'm sure we'll have uh, time for questions at the end, so also um, for, for the, um, the last 20 minutes. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Lana. Lana Weidgenant is a young climate activist who focuses uh, on food system impact uh, on climate change. Uh, you are a campaign and policy manager with ProVeg International and also a contact point of Yongo, uh, the youth constituency of the UNFCCC, uh, on uh, uh, the Agricultural Working Group. Uh, through uh, your work, you have raised the, uh, use, the youth voice on food systems, sustainable diets, and uh, tackling unsustainable protein. So we'll let you for, for six to eight minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so from young people's side, we have for several years raised strongly and clearly the absolute necessity of a food systems transformation with sustainable diets and shifts in the protein diversification as a critical aspect of that. In Yango's Interventions, which is the youth constituency here at SBs and in COP, you will find many strong statements on food systems and agriculture as part of our youth voice. There's also been over 160,000 signatures from young people around the world in a youth pledge that highlights how we as youth know that our current food system contributes to ongoing health, climate, biodiversity crises, human rights issues, and that we will only be able to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals with a fundamental transformation of our food systems. It concludes that we, as global young people, pledge to act, and that is also critical that we demand urgent, large-scale action from others, especially from decision makers in government and in business. And in this food systems transformation that we call for, we speak to the fact that food production is one of the largest drivers of climate change and environmental destruction, as other panelists have been discussing today, and also how the issue of current diets are contributing not only to a rising burden of diet-related chronic diseases, but also to these environmental issues. And to address these intertwined problems, there is an urgent need that we see to transition to sustainable and nourishing dietary patterns. So consumption patterns must shift, and protein diversification must occur to deliver food and nutrition security, protect biodiversity, and ensure a livable climate for a growing population. 
UN Climate Change and COP27, as well as SBs, must address a comprehensive food systems transformation, including a necessary focus on healthy and sustainable diets. From the UN Food Systems Summit last year, um, that also continued the year before, young people came together to share expertise and passion for food systems transformation. And even though the summit has come to an end, that has not brought an end to our collaboration. Necessary work is just getting started, and we'll draw on the newly formed bonds between young food systems advocates from across the world to push for the necessity that food systems commitments that were made last year do translate into measurable action and positive outcomes on the ground as needed. The 2021 UN Food Systems Summit highlighted the critical need to approach issues from a systematic lens, which includes responsiveness to gender and other social economic inequalities. We cannot continue to focus on problems in isolation, whether nutrition, health, environment, climate change, systems thinking is needed in order to achieve climate goals and ensure a just and healthy future for people and planet. This topic of healthy and sustainable diets can be utilized as a cross-cutting lever for a change when discussing biodiversity, water use and pollution, carbon sequestration, equity, and human health. With this in mind, young people globally have strongly advocated the importance of healthy and sustainable, nutritious and plant-rich diets. Many youth are already acting upon this priority in our own lives and communities, making changes to our own diets, um, starting global movements on this, as well as own organizations, student groups, and startups. We have also come together in an international food systems campaign called Food at COP to emphasize that the global food system contributes massively to the climate crisis and that the food that is on the menu at these UN climate change and COP events needs to reflect this reality. You state through the International Food at COP campaign that plant-based foods are overwhelmingly recognized scientifically as those with the lowest environmental impacts, and that it's important that SBs and COP walk the talk if you and climate change host countries and attendees are truly concerned about the future of the planet and the climate crisis. We know it's vitally important for SBs and COP to feel climate action through meals that are less resource intensive and better for the planet we are fighting for. Shifting to a plant-based event is only logical for one whose purpose is to fight climate change. We stand together in the belief that COP27 and the SB should acknowledge the link between food and climate and shift catering towards more climate-friendly food. After all, as you reinforced, time is precious. We cannot afford to repeatedly miss opportunities that address human, animal, and planetary health simultaneously. At these events, healthy and sustainable diets should be prominently featured. You've also called for an investment in sustainable future foods, including alternative proteins, while ensuring a just transition for vulnerable sectors so that workers' rights and livelihoods are protected. One case study in this area is the Smart Protein Project with ProVeg International, a 10 million euro project funded by the European Union. It seeks to develop a new generation of foods that are cost-effective, resource-efficient, and nutritious. The project is a partnership between more than 30 external partners, including universities, research institutions, corporations, SMEs, and NGOs. And we are at a pivotal moment for collective decision making. COP27 and other upcoming global fora are where power will be yielded and decisions made that impact us as youth for decades to come. Young people have commended the UN Food System Summit for its engagement of young people in leadership and in decision making, and we implore others to follow this approach. After all, youth engagement will only have been meaningful if the priority of youth is acted upon. And young people uplift and prioritize the importance of healthy and sustainable plant-rich diets for the health of people and the planet. We have taken action and we continue to do so. And here we call on world leaders and global fora to do the same. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lana. And uh, again, we'll have also time to develop and to have like uh, questions after um, after this. Um, so we have like now two speakers uh, from GFI, Alice Ravenscroft and uh, Varun Deshpande. 
Um, Alice Ravenscroft is head of policy at the Good Food Institute Europe. Uh, she has also a background, like Lucy Tony, working in the UK government. Um, at GFI, she leads um, a team working in Brussels, Germany, and the UK to secure evidence-based policy um, and public research funding for plant-based um, and cultivated meat. Um, Alice is going to talk about the important role that alternative proteins can play in meeting our climate targets and building uh, a resilient global food system. And uh, right after um, uh, Alice is done with, I think, four or five minutes, we will have Varun Deshpande um, that is online and is joining us uh, from, from India. He's the managing director at the Good Food Institute Asia. Uh, he grew up in Mumbai, India, and has a background in healthcare and technology uh, startup. Uh, he established and led GFI India for four years, and will also try try to have with him like a discussion about the role of protein diversification uh, from uh, a global majority perspective. So I'll let you start, Alice, and then we'll have Varun online in the call. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Raphael, um, and it's a real pleasure to be here today. Um, I will give a quick introduction to the Good Food Institute for those of you who don't know us. Um, so we are an international non-profit think tank, um, and we're working to build a more sustainable, more ethical, and more just global food system. As the other panelists have highlighted, we cannot meet our climate targets without reducing animal agriculture. At the same time, a growing population will lead to demand for meat doubling by 2050. And this is also going to coincide with increasing food insecurity driven by climate change. And that will disproportionately be impacting the world's poorest. At GFI, we firmly believe that everyone deserves a, a nourishing diet, a secure livelihood, and a safe climate. But how can we achieve this in light of these pressures? So today I want to talk about a solution. Alternative proteins, plant-based meat and cultivated meat, can reduce the environmental impact of our food system and feed more people with fewer resources. So let's look in a little bit more detail at what they are. So plant-based meat looks, cooks and tastes just like meat, but it's made entirely from plants. It can cut emissions by up to 90% and uses up to 99% less land and water compared with conventional meat. Cultivated meat is exactly the same as the beef, pork, chicken, and fish that we enjoy today, but grown directly from animal cells. It can cut emissions by up to 92% and uses up to 95% less land and up to 78% less water than conventional meat. These alternative proteins have the potential to reduce global emissions by 10 to 14 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year by 2050. Um, and that's equivalent to 14 to 20% of the emissions mitigation necessary to meet the Paris Agreement. Research shows that protein diversification could also allow 640 million hectares of land, which is an area larger than the size of the Amazon rainforest to be repurposed for more sustainable farming practices and climate mitigation and adaptation strategies, such as reforestation and ecosystem restoration. Scaling up alternative proteins could add 1.1 trillion to the global economy annually, create 10 million jobs, and cut global average crop prices by 10% by 2050 making nutritious diets more affordable. Because they require up to 95% less land and 78% less water, plant-based and cultivated meat can enhance food security, even in land and water constrained environments. They can be made with indigenous crops grown by small scale farmers to suit the needs and tastes of local communities. And because they are made without antibiotics or farming animals, they reduce the risk of antimicrobial resistance and the spread of foodborne and zoonotic diseases. So to deliver these benefits, governments must invest 10 billion each year to develop and scale alternative proteins. 
And that might sound like a lot, but just rewinding to the $1.1 trillion um, economic benefits that I mentioned a moment ago, the return on investment of, of, this, uh, uh, of this technology is sizable. Um, so it's, it's a really high leverage solution. And that, that's not even mentioning the climate and social um, benefits of the technologies. Publicly funded research has driven a solar revolution that has cut the cost of solar panels by 85% over 10 years. Governments must now deliver a protein revolution by investing in making plant-based and cultivated meat as delicious and affordable as conventional animal products. So the sustainable option becomes the default choice for consumers. As a nonprofit, the Good Food Institute is focused on ensuring that the societal benefits of alternative proteins are realized. Public R&D funding is essential if we want to ensure the democratization of these technologies and governments must provide support to ensure that this is a just transition so the smallholder farmers in developing countries are able to reap the benefits. I'd now like to hand over to Varun, who is going to be joining us virtually, um, who leads our work in Asia, to say a few words about the work that his team are doing there. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alice. Raphael, everyone, can you hear me? We can hear you very well. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for having me. And Raphael, once again, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'll be relatively brief. Um, so like GFI globally, GFI Asia is a network of organizations across the continent. So we're in India, Singapore, Japan, and Korea with partners in mainland China and Australia. But today I'm gonna to specifically focus on the unique context of the Global South and how it dovetails with the work that's happening elsewhere in the world. Uh, and of course, the Global South is prominently represented in Asia. Uh, I'll also be using India and our work in India as a lens to view the Global South. Of course, there's an incredible heterogeneity and diversity in developing countries, but one thing we can definitely say is true um, is that the challenges, the economies, the consumption context, and therefore the opportunities in these countries is quite different from the Global North, right? So if we zoom in on each of these factors, we will, of course, find that building a thriving alternative protein ecosystem and economy in these regions, like South Asia, Southeast Asia, Western, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, it demands that we locate alternative protein firmly within the local context. But we will also find that there is immense unique value that these regions can bring to the global alternative protein sector uh, in bringing it to parity with other analogous industries like renewable energy or electric vehicles. So firstly, it's important to note that Countries like India, of course, as I said, have unique challenges and characteristics. Other speakers like Zituni and Sarah have already noted these. Um, I'll start with the consumption context. Uh, it's, it's very important to underline here that uh, consumption of conventional animal proteins um, like meat, eggs, and dairy is increasing all the time in these countries in places like India. Uh, we just had uh, a very large national scale national family health survey in India, which confirmed that uh, meat self-reported meat consumption in the population has increased over the last 10 years from 71% to 77% in that survey. Uh, and this is not surprising, right? I mean, meat is an aspirational food as incomes continue to rise in places like India, Southeast Asia, even Sub-Saharan Africa over the next decades. We will see uh, an increased demand for animal protein or for protein in general. Um, and that could have dire impacts on the local uh, local environmental status. So that's something that we're really thinking about addressing through alternative proteins. Um, additionally, the agricultural supply chain and agriculture as a sector is quite unique in these countries. I think Sarah's already brought this up, but uh, India has about 50% of our population relying on agriculture from an economic standpoint. That number is not very different for Southeast Asia, right? In, in Indonesia, it's 41% of the population. Uh, we also have major public health challenges as Zituni and others have mentioned. Uh, we have simultaneous undernutrition and overnutrition. We have um, debilitating issues such as anemia, neural tube defects, et cetera, which really impact the ability of our populations to shape their own destiny and are quite tragic. But we also have additionally major food safety risks 
uh, arising from the conventional food system. So as an example, low and middle income countries uh, only house about 41% of the world's population, but they are uh, subject to about 75% of all food safety illness related deaths. And that's from the, uh, that's from GAIN. Um, and then finally, uh, we have unique economic operating models, right? So uh, Sarah already mentioned this, others have already mentioned this. We have smallholder farmers, uh, we have infrastructure challenges, we have uh, unique contexts into which any new industry like alternative proteins must fit. So I'll just speak a, uh, a little bit about the kind of work that we're doing to fit within this context and the ecosystems in this, in this part of the world are doing to fit within this context. Sarah already mentioned, I think, diversifying raw materials and inputs into alternative proteins. This is a major opportunity for us in countries like India and the Global South writ large. I mean, we have this tremendous, fantastic agricultural biodiversity, uh, which includes crops such as pulses, millets, hemp, pongamia, um, chickpea, for instance, has been highlighted as a major uh, crop that will have uh, huge growth within the alternative protein sphere. So these are things that we actively have to invest in in this part of the world. What we've seen is that crops such as rice, wheat, sugarcane, uh, because of the, the, the support that's been provided to the broader agricultural ecosystem to produce these crops over the last decades, moving over from these crops uh, to more diverse, sustainable crops that can function as inputs into alternative proteins is proving a challenge for farmers, right? I mean, you can't build a bridge that leads to nowhere. You can't build a value chain that ends in nothing. So for farmers to consider moving over into more sustainable crops like pulses and millets, they need a lucrative end market into which to sell those crops. And that's kind of, that's exactly what Sarah was talking about earlier. Uh, some of the work that we're doing with universities and academic research centers uh, and um, agricultural groups in places like India is to investigate the use of millets and pulses from a scientific standpoint in alternative protein products like plant-based meats, plant-based egg, plant-based dairy. Now, I'm not a food scientist. I just play one on TV. But if I were a food scientist, I would say words like foaming, gelling, stability, emulsification, protein dispersibility index. There's all sorts of fascinating things that we need to investigate about these crops uh, to really characterize their opportunity within the alternative protein sector. So we're doing this kind of work with uh, universities in the CGIR ecosystem and a lot of other folks. Secondly, a major opportunity that we have in this part of the world is scaling up manufacturing and driving down cost bases for the global sector. And this is very interrelated to the agricultural supply chain, right? So um, GFI globally has characterized that we need uh, a huge amount of growth in plant protein, particularly texturized plant protein production as a key ingredient within the alternative protein space globally. We need about 800, more than 800 extrusion manufacturing facilities all over the world over the next 10 years, which would cost about $27 billion to put into the ground. Now, of course, countries like India bringing their ecosystems to the table in a big way can actually drive that cost basis down. We wouldn't necessarily need to invest $27 billion in places like India, that, that overarching cost could come down uh, and we could therefore exert uh, tremendous down, downward pressure on the global cost basis for the sector in terms of the cost of ingredients as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, a major opportunity that we have is embedding nutrition density as a focus area in alternative protein. So as others have said, as I said earlier, uh, we do have major undernutrition challenges in India. And of course, adding in more ingredients that address issues like anemia and neural tube defects and other issues uh, escalates the cost initially of these alternative protein products. But in places like India, uh, if we're taking this as a, as a major lens through which to view the sector, we could really think through and drive down the cost of nutrition density within these products as well. Uh, and and uh, I think this is a, a tremendous opportunity and an imperative for us. And we're seeing a lot of interest from government to think through these opportunities as well. So we've been calling for a national mission for smart protein in India. We've been working at the intersection of government, industry, and academia to build out this vision that encompasses all of the above to firmly place India and countries like it at the center of this global protein diversification and create impact that both benefits these countries and leverages their unique advantages. And I'll end with just one example of what's possible when we bring these advantages to bear on the alternative protein ecosystem uh, from, a, from a totally different industry. The Indian Space Research Organization, or ISRO, recently sent a rover to Mars for roughly $60 million. That's six zero million USD with an M, not a B. Now that's a product of laser focus on cost innovation, on talent development, on technology transfer based on what had already happened 
within that industry over prior decades in other parts of the world. And it's a great case study of what needs to happen within alternative protein too, and what we're calling on ecosystems across this global majority, this global majority to do. Build on each region's strategic advantages, bring our collective ingenuity to the table in the spirit of friendly competition or a new space race, if you will, uh, and all in service of a more secure, sustainable, and just food system. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Varun, for joining us uh, online. Um, and uh, now we'll have our, our last speaker, Irene uh, Pizzilidi. Irene is the global head of food system advocacy uh, at Compassion in World Farming. Uh, she leads the organization Policy Advocacy, uh, work at the United Nations. I know you're also working quite a lot with UNEP, UNEA, um, and um, all relevant global uh, policy processes focusing primarily uh, on food systems uh, transformation. So I'll let you for six to eight minutes, Irene. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you, Rafa, for the intro, and thank you to all the other panelists uh, for sharing their useful insights and uh, details of their work. Compassion World Farming is a farm animal welfare organization which focuses on food systems transformation. This transformation includes moving, um, well, includes enhancing food security by moving away from high input unsustainable industrial animal agriculture to more sustainable and regenerative production systems. It also includes managing production and consumption of animal, animal source foods by shifting to predominantly uh, plant-based diets and also um, increasing the use of alternative proteins, as my colleagues have uh, shared, especially in high consuming populations. Now, within where we are, within the UNFCCC, agriculture has a home, and that home is the Coronivia Joint Work on Agriculture. This was a landmark decision a few years ago, and it has recognized the unique potential agriculture has in tackling uh, climate change. Um, it addresses six interrelated topics um, on soils, nutrient use, uh, livestock, methods of uh, assessing adaptation, and the socioeconomic and food security dimensions of climate change across the agricultural sectors. Within the Cronivia process itself, uh, Compassion supports the development of three important issues that are directly related to food security. Uh, these are the soils and, soils and nutrient use, sustainable livestock management, and sustainable <coughs> production and consumption um, of animal source uh, foods within the socioeconomic dimensions of climate change. Now, I want to tell you a story, the story of where we are now. Um, the Bonn Climate Conference has a nearly finished chair summary of conclusions. Within that document, I would like to highlight three issues that um, Compassion supports. So the first one is the recognition that soil and nutrient practices and the optimal use of nutrients, including organic fertilizers and manure management, lie at the core of the climate resilient and sustainable food production system. They can also contribute to global food security. Now, just to note that the issue of sustainable nutrient management is one of the biggest, a lot of my colleagues mentioned it, one of the biggest environmental cha challenges we're facing, um, particularly when it comes to nitrogen and phosphorus. And it's not addressed just within the UNFCCC, but also most recently at the uh, UN uh, Environment Assembly in Nairobi. The second point is the recognition that livestock management systems are very vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. Sustainably managed livestock um, are highly adaptive and highly resilient to clim climate change. That is, as I said, when we sustainably manage it. They also play broad roles in safeguarding food security, livelihood sustainability, carbon management, and nutrient cycling. An additional point here, in between the lines, that this also highlights the role that animals can play and higher welfare practices can play in mitigating climate change. The third point which exists in the texts is the recognition that socioeconomic and food security dimensions are critical when dealing with climate change in agriculture. 
Um, that is, we need systems, we need designing, uh, we need to design sustainable land, uh, sustainable and climate resilient agricultural systems by applying a systemic approach in line with global climate objectives, but also recognizing the need for long-term investments in agriculture. The key words that I would like you to take home from this part is long-term and systemic approach. That's the kind of solutions we need to be thinking when it comes to food systems. Now, where does the story go from here? Well, it continues here in Bonn and later in Egypt in Sharm el-Sheikh in November. However, it's critical that the Coronivia work continues after COP27. Um, and how will the program progress? Uh, we have the ability to influence it here and be a partner in its development. This is where this work um, takes place. I cannot stress enough the importance of agriculture and sustainable consumption of animal protein and other resource-heavy uh, foods in mitigating climate change. My colleagues have already shared the statistics and figures that underpin the urgency and the importance of the Coronivia work to progress and develop, but also the majority of these have been highlighted by the latest IPCC assessment reports. I'd like to end here by saying that I hope many of you in the audience will join us in making the, uh, the final negotiated Coronivia text the best we can achieve, but also work with us to ensure that the next phase of Coronivia will make the impact we need to keep the 1.5 degrees ambition alive. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Sorry, thank you so much, Irene, and thank you to all the speakers for like uh, sticking to, to the time. We have like now, um, we will have about half an hour of Q&A, 25 minutes. Um, so uh, if you have questions, please raise your hand in a few minutes because we will first have like um, um, Felix Dodds for a little comment about like what we just discussed and I will give you the microphone. Um, I'd like to ask Felix Dodds, that is advisor uh, to uh, Compassion on UN Matters, to help us a little bit look at uh, the roadmap uh, forward over the next years because we spoke about different processes. Here, for example, Coronivia, that is I think a topic, Irene, that you mentioned that a lot of us uh, are working on and give us an idea of uh, where and how uh, we might take these ideas and solution that were presented um, in, in this side event. Thanks very much. It won't take much time, but I think it's important to think that we have a roadmap ahead and we have a number of significant uh, UN related uh, events that are coming up in the next two years where the story that started here can be taken and built on and hopefully uh, have an impact. So we clearly have uh, the work, the final bits of work that will be done here, which will focus on, in a sense, the last two paragraphs, uh, uh, seven bits and seven uh, terror. Uh, and then we'll look at, uh, I think, tomorrow uh, or today, in fact, we'll look at the mandate to see how they develop the actual text that will go forward to uh, COP27. And then there's the recommendations that will come out of that, which um, I'll let others talk about. So that's kind of what we're going to be doing here in June. But in November, we'll be continuing that discussion and hopefully fulfilling um, a very good, work, a very good outcome, but also an idea about where do we go from now, because there's no guarantee that uh, there will be a continuation. Also, it's important to think about, and it was mentioned um, by Raphael, the issues around the methane and desertification work. But to understand the UNFCCC, you have to think of it as kind of, um, I guess, layers. So the negotiations are in the center of the layer. We do these side events and hubs on different issues where we try and build the political support for those issues that we're looking to advance in the negotiations, um, but also to highlight new issues that we think should be coming up in the future. Very important to do that. And then outside, you have the coalitions of the willing that came out of Paris and out of Glasgow, methane and desertification. They're not a mandated activity. They fit under uh, the coalitions of multi-stakeholder or multi-government in certain cases, things. And the importance there is to see whether those governments are delivering on their commitments that they made. So the accountability mechanism that already exists, but also whether there needs to be a more active uh, stakeholder look at that. We'll also see in 23, uh, of course, we'll be back here hopefully developing the next level um, uh, of the uh, 
for any of the work program. Um, in July, you'll have the first high-level uh, political forum review of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, uh, uh, which includes the SDGs. That will be at ministerial level. And then in September, you'll have the heads of state meeting on uh, the, uh, what, what has gone on as far as implementing the SDGs and the 2030 Agenda. And that is the midterm review. And clearly, a number of the goals there are relevant to the work that we're all doing. You'll also have the first review of the Food Summit. Uh, and so there's an opportunity to link those two together. Early thinking about that, I think, is crucial. And then uh, in November um, of um, 2023, uh, we'll, uh, 2023 we'll, ha we'll be in the United Arab Emirates uh, for COP28. And then finally, I just remind people about what uh, Irene said about the UN Environment Assembly, which will be in uh, February and March uh, 2024, where the issue of nitrogen will come back up and the, hopefully the report on animal welfare will be part of it. So that's a kind of quick look at some of the points where you can start to build activities, campaigns and policy around an agenda that's going to be, I think, very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. And indeed, like pretty busy months is coming ahead, I, I can see already. Um, so like um, maybe if we have questions, I would just simply ask you to raise your hand and we'll probably uh, take like three questions first and then like get back to the panel. And uh, of course, you can just like tell me uh, if you would like to, to take the microphone on that. So I see a question there. Thank you very much uh, for all the presentations. Um, my name is Benja. I'm from ES Netherlands student network in agriculture. And um, so I wanted to reflect on what you just said. I think that the systemic approach is really important. Like, you know, at first mapping all the actors that can play a role and then, you know, initiating change from the top, but also from the, from the bottom. And uh, unfortunately, the one panelist has left, but I think that also, you know, the meat industry could be interested in alternatives if they are provided. and. Uh, are also pioneers in, in doing so, like the German example of uh, Rügenwalder Mühle, who are now producing more uh, vegetarian options than they are producing meat, is, I think, a good example of that. And also bottom-up approaches, like uh, civil society can play a big role in that, because it's a transformation of the system that we have. So, um, okay, now coming to my question, um, I always forbid myself uh, to ask that to myself, because I am a vegetarian because I am not supporting uh, mass production and mass holding, I don't know, you know, cruelty in that sense. So I'm thinking um, in a future in like 100 years where everybody is subsistence farming and, you know, in balance with their own footprints, uh, are we allowed to eat meat? Thank you very much. Interesting question. I will take another two, exactly, and then we can go for our first round of, of answers. David? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the great presentations. I'm David with uh, Slack and Trust, uh, Think Tank. Um, yeah, just had any questions. It was really interesting to see. Um, do you have any, uh, beyond the One Acre Fund, uh, which was a really great example, of, and there's also the Indian one from sort of a government standpoint, and Varun Despande talked about sort of a a benign um, uh, arms race to, to the moon as we had way back in the Cold War, right? But that seems there's more and more government action around that, or they need to ha that have some really good examples of investment and sort of a holistic approach to it, so it's not just the market forces uh, bringing it forward. That was just a, any good examples of governments. Thank you, and one little more. Lovely, thank you very much. Stephanie from Humane Society International. And yeah, again, thanks to the panel for the great um, presentations. Um, I have a question specifically about Corinivia, um, given that that's the only item agenda under UNFCCC that focuses on agriculture and food security. So we know that so far it's included workshops on livestock management, but it seems that largely it's ignored the climate mitigation potential um, of shifting consumption and production towards more plant-based food systems. Um, which is in line with the IPCC recommendations um, and also requires reducing global livestock numbers. So I was wondering 
if you could explain or expand on what do you think uh, the recommendations that come out of COP27, when Coronavir will be discussed again, should include uh, for taking it forward? Um, and maybe what challenges you know, parties have seen so far in, in uh, addressing the, the kind of behaviour shift that we need to see in foods? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Um, so we maybe we'll take like the three questions. I don't know if someone has like wanted to start uh, on, the, on this. Um, Alice? I'll, I'll, we'll go from Alice then. <laughs> Thanks very much um, for those really interesting questions. Um, so I will start, I'll, I'll go in order. So on the question uh, of in a hypothetical scenario in 100 years um, where people are uh, in balance in, in terms of their consumption and their footprint, are we allowed to eat meat? Um, so one thing that I would say is that... Uh, cultivated meat and plant-based meat um, provide the opportunity for people to, con to eat the, um, the, the foods that they enjoy, um, but without the uh, carbon footprint. Um, so in a way, it allows people to have their cake and eat it, as it were. Um, the other thing that I would highlight is that actually because um, development of alternative proteins um, has the potential to free up a lot of land space, um, that then creates space for more sustainable farming practices. So um, you could, for example, uh, hypothetically see um, alternative proteins sitting alongside um, more sustainable, high we higher welfare um, agroecology approaches to farming. Um, so, um, yeah, my answer to your question is yes. Um, <laughs> and then the next question, um, yeah, government examples, uh, uh, governments that are, are doing good stuff in this space. Um, so I think there are a few really promising examples to point to. And obviously, we earlier heard from a representative from the government of Finland um, talking about the fantastic work that they're doing there. Um, I will uh, just pick out a few examples. So um, the Netherlands, um, the government just a few weeks ago um, announced a 60 million euro investment into um, cultivated meat. Um, and that's just like the first tranche of many. So I think that over the next few years, it's going to total um, 320 million euros. Um, so that's really promising to see them uh, supporting the development of these important technologies. Um, another example is Israel, um, who also have been uh, investing um, significantly into the alternative protein sector. Um, they also have a uh, national alternative protein strategy, um, which is something that we'd like to see um, more governments uh, doing too. Um, couple more examples. The US just last year um, uh, launched their flagship cultivated meat research center. Um, Denmark has been, has also in the last year announced a really significant uh, investment in plant-based uh, meat. Um, that's, yeah, that's probably, those are probably enough examples, um, but basically lots of exciting things um, happening already. Um, and then on the third question, um, so what should uh, the COP27 uh, recommendations include? I think it was. Um, so one thing that I would flag is um, I would love to see uh, alternative proteins being recognised um, as a really crucial climate solution. Um, I don't think that we can achieve our climate targets without them, but they, they seem to not be on the agenda, or at least they're, they're very much neglected relative to uh, the impact that uh, they could achieve. Um, and another thing that um, I would love to see is more governments um, pledging to invest in alternative proteins, in, in the research and development of these technologies. Um, yeah, just as, as we've seen um, fantastic uh, public funding in the renewable energy sector, and that's been like absolutely transformational for our, our ability to decarbonize that sector. Um, 
I'd love to see uh, government investment uh, into the alternative proteins sector. I will stop there and let the other panelists jump in too. Thank you. Irene, do you want to jump in? Um, I'm, yeah, sure. I will um, start by answering the third question first. Um, so, um, well, the first thing is uh, around this work, the continuation of the Coronivia work, is um, that we see it continued after COP27. So without a clear mandate on how this work will progress, we won't be able to see this work progressing. So that's the first step. The, the second step is that as it stands right now, the text does not identify how member states can take forward, forward the recognitions that have been made. So it is important for the ongoing work um, to share any policies, measures, actions, and that includes national strategies and national plans for the implementation of whatever has been recognized and uh, assessed at the Coronivio work so far. And the last point is that um, capacity building requirements should be identified. So these might include uh, Peer, review, peer reviewing among member states that are at similar levels of development and also identifying funding needs uh, for developing countries. And the, the final point on progressing this work is that, um, and that addresses the challenge, the challenges that you mentioned, is that we definitely need to review existing workshop reports and identify gaps that we need to go back and work more on them and sort of try to retrieve further information and further details, build on further information and details. Um, with regard to countries that, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't remember the question. <laughs> it, was it specifically about um, at, uh, new technologies and alternative proteins, or was it in general countries that are um, more positive? Because I think my colleague, if it's just an alternative protein, she covered pretty much everything. Okay. Um, and I want to go back to the first question um, about uh, are we will, be, will we be allowed to eat meat? And I just want to say in 100 years from now, uh, if we have the food system transformation we see and we have a really successful post-2030 agenda and we've actually realized the urgency of, the, of all the issues we are faced with because of the way we consume, we produce and we consume, not just meat in general, uh, but let's say animal sourced foods, um, and the options we will have because of technology and innovation, but also having um, reintroduced to ourselves the agro-biodiversity and how much plants we have in the world, and uh, it's not just few species, my answer would be, would we still want to eat meat the way we do now? Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, I think we're just maybe let, going to let Varun join in because uh, I see that you're, you're back online, Varun. So maybe you want to comment on the questions. I uh, hope you managed to hear with the microphones. And then we're going to go to Sarah and Lana. Yeah, yes, I heard. And I uh, apologize for being this kind of looming presence in the background of everyone's uh, answers. Yeah, I, just, I wanted to underline a little bit uh, what Alice said earlier. Um, investment by governments in alternative proteins has been promising thus far. So. Alice mentioned uh, several examples, uh, which included Denmark, Finland, uh, Israel, the Netherlands, and there are a few others as well. Canada, Australia are both investing very deeply in the plant protein supply chain. So the extraction of plant proteins and turning them into these delicious, sustainable foods that provide the needs of people and feel like a simple switch and not a sacrifice, right? Which is what alternative proteins are all about. Uh, but I, I wanted to underline the point that Alice made towards the end there, which is that all of this is being done currently on a shoestring budget relative to uh, the other industries that are that are very much analogous to it uh, and relative to the overarching needs of the space. So as an example, Alice mentioned renewable energy. Renewable energy received about 500 billion with a B dollars in investment last year. And additional to that, about $32 billion with a B in public sector R&D funding, right? Whereas, and that's in one year, just last year. Whereas alternative proteins have in history received less than $1 billion in research funding in the entire history of the space, right? So uh, there's an opportunity here to come to parity with those sectors and to, to, to realize all the fantastic sustainability and economic gains that we're seeing in those sectors, but we really do need to step up funding and, and get to 
uh, what Alice was describing, which is national plans and really coordinated strategies with, with major investment from governments in these uh, technologies. And governments are already aligned in terms of uh, they have key goals, economic growth goals, job creation goals, enterprise value creation goals, climate resilience goals, public health goals uh, that very much uh, resonate with the alternative protein sector and fit in very well with the alternative protein sector. So we hope we can really bring alternative proteins to the uh, and bring it a seat at the table of this emerging climate discourse. Thank you, Varun. We'll let Sarah know. Yeah, just to jump in briefly on the second question about public investment and innovation in this space. Um, all of the great examples that Alice mentioned, those are all in high consuming, high income countries. And what we're seeing with our project is that there are very few um, funding opportunities for uh, innovative projects like ours in low consuming, low income countries, despite there still being a really valuable impact proposition from either a food security or environmental perspective. So um, we're hoping to see more develop in that space. Thanks. Thank you. Lana? Uh, for me, I'll just quickly add in on the third question around the Cornelia Joint Work on Agriculture, that also you for pushing um, for future topics for Cornelia to focus on. So some of the reasons that some of these uh, central topics haven't been covered is because there haven't been workshops on them. They've only had workshops on limited topics thus far. Um, and some of the, the key uh, topics that we're asking for them to feature in uh, future discussions and uh, workshops is healthy, sustainable diets is one of the key ones, as well as just transition and food security and food sovereignty. Thank you, Lana. Uh, I think we have time to take one or two more questions from the floor, if there is more. Yeah. Um, yes, hi, my name is Ingo. I'm a member of the um, high-level working group on uh, innovation, which is actually like a very new vehicle on this. And my question to you is, what do you think, where are we at? What are the key barriers to growth in plant-based protein? Is it, are we demand constrained? That means there are not enough products that are interesting for people. Are we supply constrained? Is the production of plant-based uh, protein still too expensive? Um, or is there a problem in the middle? like around uh, distribution or, or, or funding, like kind of like real priority, the key two, three barriers that, that make this slower than it should be. Thank you all. <clears throat> Thank you all for the presentations. They were really interesting. I have a question regarding the cultivated meat as we were talking about alternatives, plant-based meat and cultivated meat. And I was actually wondering, in regards to affordability and equal distribution, if cultivated meat is actually an alternative or if it could be an alternative in the next five or 10 years. Thank you. Thank you. So I think we can go back to the panel. And also, like, I would ask you if you have like, a final thought or a final message that you want to, um, to, uh, to, to have, like, for, as we're going to close in five minutes, uh, would be the, a good time, and I will let you answer. Who would like to, to take the questions first? Uh, maybe Alice? Or? Thank you. Thanks for those really interesting questions. So I'll take the question on plant-based first and then uh, move on to the question on cultivated meat. Um, so key barriers to growth. Uh, in the plant-based sector. Uh, so, so one thing to highlight, first of all, is that we've seen fantastic growth in this sector um, to date. Uh, I think uh, what I would like to highlight is the need for more um, research and development funding um, and close to market innovation. Um, I think we've barely scratched the surface in terms of the potential of this uh, category. Um, there are so many more ingredients that um, we need to explore and, and so many more approaches um, that can be discovered. Um, so I think uh, I'd also maybe emphasize uh, the importance of open access um, uh, research and development funding. So uh, funding for open access research because um, that's such a catalyst um, to progress um, compared with uh, companies uh, doing their own private research and uh, keeping that behind closed doors. Um, on the question of cultivated meat and uh, affordability uh, and timelines. Uh, so uh, I 
wouldn't like to put a specific date on it. Um, I think there's lots of really exciting progress that's already happening. Um, but so, so I would emphasize that affordability is absolutely crucial. And uh, at, at the Good Food Institute, we really see this uh, as a solution that uh, needs to be accessible to and affordable for everyone. Um, and I'd like to highlight that um, I think this is why um, government research and development funding is so important. Um, so a, a lot of the research that uh, needs to be done um, and that, that scientists want to be doing is focused on achieving price parity um, with conventional meat products. So um, basically, the, the more we invest, the more we're able to catalyze progress um, and the sooner we'll be able to have um, affordable cultivated meat products um, on the market. Thank you. Um, Irene, do you want to? Yeah. I, I'm, honestly, I think Alex covered the, the, the answers very well. So as we have uh, only a few minutes, yeah. I just wonder whether somebody else wants yeah. to jump in. But thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Sarah or like Lana, is there like a, a point you'd like to make on that? Um, no, 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 no. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> so we have like three minutes left. Uh, I think you know it's. Uh, thank you so much for attending. And like, sorry, Zituni had to leave also, um, as um, as Anna as they have like uh, further meetings. But I think I just wanted to to wrap briefly and say that you know we talk a lot at the UN about like. Um, the problems caused by industrial animal agriculture, by the system as it is. Uh, we tried today to present a little bit more like the solutions landscape, which is there's not only one single solution that you know will solve all the problems, that's everybody agrees on that. But um, we, we know that protein diversification, shifting to more healthy plant-rich diets, especially in regions uh, like, um, like the ones we're at the moment, like in the north, is, is really crucial. And there is like other solutions that you know we're discussing in Coronivia as agroecology, as other topics uh, that are a lot um, of, I think, like the, the, um, the solutions that we have to implement. Um, so we see, I think, a lot of progresses on the discussions, at least at the UN. We remember a few years ago when food system, agriculture, diets, everything was a little bit still ridiculed by, by many, and it was not really a serious part of, of, the, of the negotiations and discussions. Um, it has become like now a serious part. We know that every like UN report, one after the other, mentions uh, these topics, also linking, linking it to zoonosis, to um, a lot of other topics from food security to, to health. But uh, we know that we de desperately need actions, and we need like actions coming in like now, like it means in, in Sharm El Sheikh, it means like at COP28 later, etc. But we really need to to step this uh, up and to, to go like much faster in the implementation. So it was, I think, very interesting also to hear like concrete examples uh, from Finland. And we're very encouraged to see like, you know, first countries um, shifting a little bit like their policies uh, in the way they subsidize and the way they encourage or promote like different products. Uh, but it's only a beginning and we need really like, of course, uh, a system, system a systemic approach, but also I think we talked about long-term investment, but also long-term vision of like the food systems we want, and uh, those really need, of course, radical to, to change radically. So we hope that we also like have like you know uh, started like a first step like in, in the COPs, etc. But we need now really governments to to accelerate, implement action, and implement coherent policy uh, that allow uh, all these um, shifts around food systems. So thank you so much, and if you want to get in touch with us, we'll be hanging around like in uh, for the next minutes. Thank you. Thanks a lot.